So among the Yamaleli-speaking people in Papua New Guinea, a little island off the mainland, they have a word that they use when they see each other, they greet each other, and that's the word kaiwa. So this morning, kaiwa, greetings. It's good to be with you. But they also use that word when they're leaving. They use that word to say thank you. And so again, thank you, kaiwa, for allowing me to come and to share God's word uh, with us today as we see what he has for us. As Pastor said, we've served with Wycliffe for 40 years, and mostly a lot of that in Papua New Guinea. We've seen great things happening. We've seen God's spirit really moving. But we've retired from Wycliffe uh, 40 years, but as believers in Christ, we never really retired, do we? And right now I'm serving on uh, the board of directors for Push the Rock Ministry uh, in Emmaus. Some of you may be familiar with that, a sports evangelism ministry. And I'm also on their care team. Because as Pastor prayed, we need to be praying for our missionaries, uh, praying for them for their care. And so it's a joy to be able to serve God in that way. And that's what I want to share with you today. The idea about serving a mission calling God. We have a God who's doing just that. He's calling people to a mission. He's calling people to a mission and he's been doing it since the beginning of creation. And so we want to look at what it means for having a God who calls us to mission, what it means to be called. What's the cost of being called to be on mission? And what are the results of being called by a mission calling God? Let's pray. Father, quiet our hearts. Allow no distractions to come. Allow us to be open to your word, to your leading. Open our hearts, Father, that we may hear from you today. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So from the very first pages of the Bible, in creation, we see God active. As you go through the Genesis account, he creates light, he creates darkness, separates the water uh, from water, he creates sky, the moon, the star, the animals, he, he creates. And then he creates man, and he puts man in the garden. He creates Eve. But then he gives them a mission. He calls them. And so we read there in Genesis 127 and 128, he say he blesses them. He blesses them as male and female. And he tells them to be fruitful and increase. Fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. That's the mission that they're given. In chapter 2, he further talks about that, especially in verse 15, as he talks about mission to Adam. He says he put the man and put him in the garden to work it and to care for it. So Adam was to take care of the garden, take care of the animals. He also, as you read on in that passage a little later, he gets to name the animals. Hey, kids, how cool would it be to name one of the animals, huh? That'd be really neat to be able to name them you think about some of the names that we call. Why would you call it an anteater and a platypus? Uh, where do you get names like that? And yet God gave Adam that opportunity, the mission to, to do that. So that was the mission that God had called Adam to do, to look after the garden, to care for it. And he did that until the day when he and Eve sinned. They became disobedient, disobeyed God's command. And so they're thrown out of the Garden of Eden, and then life changed for them. Life became harder, and with it, the need to call others to mission. Read further into the creation story, beyond the creation story, to Noah. Here was a man that God wanted, called to be able to do part of his. Instead of his creation going on, remember, God was going to destroy it because of all the wickedness that was there. And so he calls Noah a man who was righteous, and he calls him to a mission. And what was his mission? To build a boat. To build a boat, a big boat. Have any of you been to the creation, uh, the ark thing there? Pretty big, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, it's a huge thing. And he worked on that for years and years and years. Can you imagine the people looking at him, sneering? Think about your building project out here. If that went on for years and years and years, what would people think? And yet he was faithful to his mission. 
He was faithful to the calling that God had given him to build this ark to save his people. And so we know the story of that, about Adam, where God called him to do a mission, and he completed that mission. After the flood, though, he calls someone else. He calls Abram, who's going to be called Abraham. He calls him to a mission. He tells him in Genesis chapter 12, chapter 1, and going through verse 4, he tells him to leave, leave the land that he's in. He tells him to leave and to go to another place that God has called him to go to. And so God calls him to a mission. He tells him to go. He doesn't back down. He goes. Abraham goes. And he says that he's going to be a blessing. He's going to be a blessing. He's going to make his name great. He's going to bless the nations because of him. This was the task that Abraham was given. And yet, as we see through the pages of Scripture, that really didn't happen. The Israelites failed on their mission of being a blessing to the nations. But yet that is why God called Abraham. He called him to be a blessing to the nations, and we'll see how God continues to do that. After Abraham, we go to Moses, the story of Moses. We all know that. Uh, if any of you have gone to Sight and Sound and saw the Moses uh, one? Yeah, they do a wonderful job, don't they? Moses was called by God. He was brought up in Pharaoh's house, but God called him to a mission. In Exodus chapter 3, we hear God's call to Moses, to mission. He says, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. We know that Moses made a lot of excuses, but that was his mission. God had called Moses to go and to lead his people out of Israel. Well, we could spend some more time going through the Bible and looking at the ones and how God had called people to a mission. He called a shepherd to be a king. He called a farmer shepherd to be a prophet. He called men to be judges over Israel. He called a fisherman and a tax collector to be disciples. And he called a young woman to give birth to the king of kings. God is a mission calling God. Well, it's not just the ones in the Bible that God has called to a mission. He calls all of us, as has been expressed already here this morning. He still calls people to a mission today. We have a God who calls us to mission, to do a task that he wants us to do, that only we can do. He has given us certain gifts and abilities to do that. It's not the same mission for all of us. My mission is different than yours. Yours is different than mine. He calls us separately to our own mission for him. And he's calling us to a mission that's based on a few things. The first thing is that his love for us. Jeremiah 31.3 tells us that God has loves us with an everlasting love. He loves us. And he wants us to be part of what he is doing in the world. He's drawing us with loving kindness. We read John 3.16. His love is for us. It's not just his love for us, but our love for him, for what he has done for us, giving us salvation. Second thing, his calling is based on his glory. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 6 and 7 says, I will say to the north, give them up. To the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. God has called us to do mission for him, for his glory, for his kingdom. It's also based on his gifts to us through his spirit. You can read in 1 Corinthians 12, you can read in Romans 12, Ephesians 4, also in Peter, about the gifts that God has given through his spirit to us. Each of us are given a spirit, a spiritual gift that he wants us to use. He's given us personality, different personalities. You can see that in those of you who have family and have kids. Each kid's personality is a little different, isn't it? They're not all the same. God gives us our own personalities. He gives us our own passions, our own motivations to serve him. They're unique to us, but he has given them to us to be used for him for his glory, because of his love for us, because of his kingdom's sake. That's the God of the Bible 
that we serve. He calls us to mission. He calls us to serve him. Now, none of this really makes any sense until we first understand and believe certain things. The first thing we must believe is that God is who he says he is. That we have God's word, that we have his promises, and he tells us those things. When he was talking with Moses, discussing his mission, he asked, he asked God, well, who should I say sent me? Uh, who is, who, who, how will they listen to me? Maybe we feel that way too sometimes. God calls us to go out and to speak and to share. Who am I? How can I do it? And remember, Moses says, I can't speak. I can't speak. And so God tells him, here's what you're supposed to do. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, God says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Do you believe that God is who he says he is? Do you believe that from your deepest core values, that God is the God of the Bible? We're only going to respond to people who know we have authority or control. We believe that God has the authority. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's omniscient, all-knowing. Do we believe that? Do we live our lives knowing that he is the God who does all these things? Who is all these things with that? If a coworker tells me what to do, opposed to my boss, ah, I might listen, I might not. But if my boss tells me what to do, I'm going to listen to him. God is our boss. God is the one who calls us. He wants us to serve him. We do well to listen to him. Secondly, we need to understand that God's word is true. God's word is truth. Do we believe that it is true? Believe me, today in this world, the Bible, God's word is coming under attack, isn't it? It is coming under attack. And do we believe that this is God's word to us? God speaking to us. Not just here, but around the world. But it's crucial that we believe that God's word is true if we're to be called to a mission. The Bible continues to be the best-selling book year after year. And that's why Wycliffe Bible Translators is committed to seeing God's word into all the languages. I have a little, I have my little stack of things here. And my last one here is S-I-L-P-N-G, <clears throat> God's word in every language, in every life. And that's our motto. That's what we believe. We believe that God's word needs to be heard in a language that people can understand. Now, how many of you grew up in here with the King James Bible? Yeah, okay. I, I grew up with the King James Bible. It makes sense to me. I memorize a lot of verses from that. But to some people, that doesn't speak. How many versions of the Bible do you think there are today? I think there's probably close to around 400 different versions of the English Bible. Find one that can speak to you. But that's why Wycliffe is saying, hey, we need to get to these minority language groups. And it's not just Wycliffe. There's other ones. You have Cross World. You have Pioneers. You have Lutheran Bible Translators. You have Pioneer Bible Translators. Ones who want to see God's word in the languages of the people so that they can hear it and understand it and believe it and know that God's word is true, that they can believe it. It is truth. The third thing that we need to remember is that the God will be with us and provide us with what we need. Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We know that when God calls us, he's not going to leave us by ourselves. That God is with us. He will always be with us. He will strengthen us. He will provide what we need. God does not call the qualified, he qualifies the called. The ones who he calls, he will give what they need, what you need to serve him. Because he knows you better than you know yourself. He knows who you are. He knit us in our mother's womb. And so he knows who we are and how he wants to use us, how he wants us to serve him. So we must believe these three things. God is who he says he is. God's word is true. 
and that he's going to be with us and provide us with what we need. We need to be open to God's calling. We need to be using our gifts and our talents uh, for him. <clears throat> you might not think that you can do what God's asking you to do, but remember that he knows you and he knows your potential. He called Moses to be a leader for the children of Israel, even when Moses made excuses. In Matthew chapter 4, if you would read that passage, 8 to 12, he calls the disciples. How many of you are watching The Chosen? Anyone watching The Chosen? Yeah, that's a very interesting one, but it's taken through the life of Jesus and the disciples. And look at the group of people that God called to be his disciples. Uh, Jesus called to be his disciples. What a motley crew, huh? And yet God knew who they were. He knew their potential. And that's what God does with us too. He knows our potential. He called ones to be fishers, fishermen to be fishers of men. And he calls us to the same today. He wants us to win others into the kingdom, to be his servants. There are very few things in life that are free. You know, uh, we used to always say with Wycliffe, there's no free lunch. Um, uh, everything doesn't always come free with that. So there is a cost involved somehow, somewhere in serving God. Listen to the words of Jesus as he tells his disciples what it means to be a disciple of his. I think that's up on the passage there, Luke chapter 14. Oops, sorry, here. Yep, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Jesus is talking about there is a cost to following him. It's not just always going to be a bed of roses. It's not always going to be pleasant. God calls us sometimes to be in hard places. He calls us, he says, there's a cost involved in being a disciple for him. Remember the story of the young ruler who comes to Jesus in Matthew chapter 19? He has kept all the commandments, and he's really excited about this. That, you know, I've done this all. And what does Jesus say? He says, you lack one thing. Sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. The cost of following. And that young ruler, that young man, went away sad because he had great wealth. He wouldn't give it up. He wouldn't part with it. What are we holding on to when God is calling us? What are we holding on to? What are our excuses? We need to give them to God and heed his call to mission. There's another cost to being in relationship with God and serving him. This is found in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. Paul, in that epistle to the Philippians, tells us, For it has been granted to you on behalf of of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Whoa, we don't like that part, do we? We like the part about believing, but we don't like the part about suffering for him. And yet, think about our brothers and sisters in Christ in foreign places, places where it's hard, working in the 1040 window, working in Muslim communities, working in other places where it is hard to be there. They suffer. Uh, we get uh, the voice of the martyrs, and we hear about all the things that are happening there. Uh, the Bible League also is doing a great work in many places, but they're working in places where people suffer for being believers in Jesus Christ. We have been spared a lot of that here in this country, but we need to realize that sometimes we suffer in little ways. How many of you are mocked or made fun of for your belief, for the values that you hold to very strongly? And yet we need to hold on to those because God has called us to that. God has given us those values. He wants us to serve him. And if that's what we need to do to suffer for him, we need to do that. <clears throat> Paul was one who was called to a mission. You remember the story of Paul in chapter 9 of Acts as he's on the way to Damascus to take care of the, the Believers of the way, followers of Christ, to 
put them in prison, bring them back to Jerusalem, and yet God meets him there, and he calls him to serve him, to be his mission to the Gentiles. And yet, as you read through the book of 1 Corinthians, and if you go to uh, chapter <clears throat> 11, you read verses 16 to 29, you read a lot about what Paul suffered. It talks about him being stoned. It talks about him being beaten and flogged. Talking about being lost out at sea, adrift, and all kinds of things. As you read that list of what Paul suffered, and yet Paul persevered, Paul continued on because he knew his calling. He knew that he was called to be a servant. He was called to serve God. That was his mission, and he did that. I don't know too many of us that would be willing to go through what Paul did, yet Paul very easily accepted it as following the call of God on his life. When the first Moravian missionaries went to Papua New Guinea, none of them lived to finish their first term. And yet the missionaries that followed that group from, from Europe, they packed all their belongings in coffins because they didn't believe that they would come back. And that God had called them in that way to be there. In April of 1995, I became the acting director of our branch in Papua New Guinea. And we had a translator who was working, doing a checking session with two of his Nabok men. And I was in my office and I got a phone call that there was something that happened in that office. Uh, the one co-translator, Papua New Guinean man, was having some mental issues, was hearing voices. They were looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And this man, these voices were coming on very strong. And so he wanted to stop the voices and he took an ax and he struck the head of Edmund Fabian, the translator. I was called down to the scene to get him, called our clinic. Edmund didn't make it. Uh, he passed away. And yet his wife, she carried on the work. She carried on the work. Edmund had finished his part, his task, but Grace took it from there. Grace, I think, lives in Douglasville. Grace Fabian, she has a book called Amazing Grace. Uh, it's a wonderful story if you ever read it. But you think about ones who give up their lives for the gospel to make sure that people will hear God's word, to have it, to hold it, to believe it. So if you're hearing these stories and you're thinking that's a good reason not to go, into mission, <laughs> let me assure you that there are joys also that come from that. <laughs> Think about Jonah. Jonah was one who was called to a mission. He was called to go to Nineveh, a very wicked city, not a pleasant place to be. And what's he supposed to do? He's supposed to preach, preach the good news. He tries to run away from God, doesn't he? So he goes down to Joppa. He goes down into the boat. And then eventually he goes down into the sea. You see, when we try to run away from God, the only direction we're going is down. God doesn't want us to do that. Don't run away from God. You can't run away from God. And you know the story of Jonah. You've heard it said that the best place to be is in the center of God's will and God's calling is sure. And when you hear it and you're open to hearing his call, our response should be the response that Paul gave in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we are to be living sacrifices for him. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 6 also records Isaiah's commission. Remember that story where the uh, seraph comes with a coal and he puts a burning coal on his lips and says, who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. That should be our response when God calls. When we hear God's call to our lives, here I am, send me. There are joys to serving, though, not just being uh, the, the cost to it. There are joys and rewards for serving God. Some pictures that are showing up on the screen. Joy is seeing people come to Christ as their Savior. If you've ever led someone to Christ, what a joy that is to see that. Joy is helping to get a church planted and discipling new believers to see a new church growing new believers coming to know Jesus. It's getting God's word translated 
So you can see in this, the picture behind me, translated into the language of a people group who didn't have God's word. What a joy that is. We've had the privilege of being able to go to a couple of New Testament dedications and just to see the joy that is there when people receive God's word in their language. Some of them just take it and they hug it. Uh, how many times have we hugged our Bibles? Uh, having God's word is so precious and many times we take it for granted. And joy is helping people who have needs, who need help. That's something that we all can do. We can help those who need help. The rewards are seeing smiles. They're seeing changed lives. Sometimes it's tears of joy that are streaming down the cheeks and faces of people. It's knowing that you have made a difference in the life of someone by helping them, whether in a big way or a small way. They say that being a grandparent is a reward for not killing your children when they were teenagers. <laughs> and those of you who are grandparents, you may understand that uh, pretty well with that. But you make a difference in the lives of people by serving God. You see, the calling does not mean that you need to be a pastor. You don't need to be a missionary, as we think of that word today. God's call is to people to serve him with a mission in all walks of life. It doesn't matter what you do. You can't use that excuse. We, as Wycliffe Bible translators, people think, well, you translate the Bible. Well, my wife and I, we were in the support services. So we supported the work of Bible translation. All of us have a role or task that we can, can do. Uncle Cam, who was the founder of Wycliffe Bible Translators, once said that maybe the only people you can't use are a one, one arm paper hanger, uh, but you can use just about everybody else. God calls us all. He has gifted us. He knows who we are, and he calls us to a mission with him. God's calling us to a mission. Are we hearing that mission? Are we involved in a mission for him? Sometimes that means not just across the sea, but maybe it's across the street. Maybe it's in our places of business. What is God calling us to do? It's been said that every soul with Christ is a missionary, and every soul without Christ is a mission field. And so God calls us in that way. The verses that were read before the message are ones that we usually associate with missions. John 3.16, talking about God's love for the world. God loves the world. He loved it so much that he sent his son to die so that all of us, everyone, could have eternal life with him. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, the Great Commission, where God says, not just go, but as you are going. He is assuming that we are going to be involved in a mission. We are going to be involved in serving him. So as you are going, make disciples of all the people. Talk to ones about Christ. Talk to them. And then Acts 1, 8 says that we are to be witnesses. Witnesses, like I said, at home, across the street across the sea. Wherever we are, we are to be witnesses for him to the ends of the earth. We do have a God who calls us to mission, to serve him, to serve others. In fact, we could say we serve God best when we serve others. Being a servant, being that slave, that doulos that Paul was, many of the gospel or the epistles that Paul writes, he always says, I am a servant of the Lord using that word douloi, doulos, uh, serving him. We are to be the hands and feet. We are to show the love of God to others. Are you serving a God who is calling you to mission? Are you listening? Are you open to hearing God's call in your life to be involved in his great global task? This is an exciting time in the world in terms of Bible translation and one's coming to Christ. There's a lot happening. Uh, Bible translations, New Testament dedications are happening all over the world. And I'm sure as you talk with Crossworld and talk with pioneers, they will tell you stories too about how God is on the move. His spirit is moving. And we need to be involved in this. We need to be a part of this. Don't you want to be a part of something that's bigger than yourself? And that's what God calls us to. He calls us to be faithful to him. 1 Thessalonians 5.24, I believe this last verse, 
He says, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Remember, as God calls, he's faithful. He will do what he has asked you to do. He will be with you, beside you, and he will open all the doors that need to be opened if we are obedient to God's calling to us, to his mission, not for our glory, but for his kingdom and for his glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's with joyful hearts that we come to you knowing that you love us. You love us with an everlasting love. And you don't just love us, you love the world. You loved it so much that you sent your son to die so that we could have eternal life and that we could share that with others, not keep it to ourselves, but to share the good news that you are a God who loves. You are a God who calls. You're a God who needs to be served, a God who needs to receive all the glory. So we thank you for who you are, for your word, and for your love for us. May we reciprocate and love you by serving you, by serving others. And we'll give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.